just said is, this is the beginnings of what God was thinking about when he was creating this thing that we live on called the earth. And in his mind and in his th imaginings and in his creativity, he said, this is what I desire and this is what I want to bring forth. But one thing I want you to notice is God gave man work before he gave man woman. So brothers, I know you may be in love, but you need a job before you get a wife. Because where are you going to live after you're married? Not with mama and daddy. <laughs> so we see here God already had work prepared for man before he even brought him forth. Work is vital for, for man. Work is something that you, ha you thrive in. Work is what you are made to do and built to do. And that's what he called you to do first before he gave you woman. Let's move down to Genesis 2. Now, interesting here, right? We were in Genesis 1, and we were talking about what God had desired to do. Well, in Genesis 2, this is where we see that he actually took this and did it. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Say living. Living. Breathing. breathing. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. There's so much here, and I don't have time, and you've probably heard messages taught on it. When God formed the man, and when God brought him from the dust of the ground, it says that he squeezed him into, into, into shape, and he formed him from that dust. And nothing happened until he breathed into him, right? Right? No life was there. There was no movement. There was nothing until the breath of God was blown into that lump of clay that he had in his hands. And what I love about this is that we heard above that he said, I'm all, I've already got him created in my mind and in my heart. This is where I'm going to go down and do it. But remember, he said, I'm going to make them male and female. And so you understand as you study on, and we're talking about men today, so I don't want to go into Eve so much. But it said that when he created him, he then planted a garden and he placed the man in Eden. He didn't just say, okay, son, good luck. Now find where I've told, I've got something ready for you. Now go find it. No, he put him there. The only human created from the soil was a man. So ladies, the men were the dirt clods, remember? And we came out of them. <laughs> So men are used to being dirty. Men are using, used to getting up under houses and having to do things. Men are used to working on nasty cars. And men are okay with having to kill a spider for you because they were from the earth. They're earthy. Or they should be comfortable with that. Females did not come from the dirt. The males came from the dirt. And as you study Genesis, you realize and, and you know the story of how God brought her forth. But what I want to touch on today is that when God did it this way, he was showing the order of family. I'm going to bring the man first and then the woman will come out of him and then the children will come out of her. Just like a house, come on, just like a building, just like something that you create, you got to start somewhere. And when you get ready to build something, you got to start from the bottom and you start with foundation. Can you say foundation? Anything that you want to build, you have to first start with the foundation. Am I correct? So the male is God's chosen foundation. And he is the bottom. He's the first. Just like I said, he supports the family. Bishop, would you come up here, please? And let's give him an illustration. He is first. He is, we think bottom with foundation. And yes, he is the bottom. A lot of times you've been told, oh, you're the head of the home. No, I beg to differ. You're the bottom. So man first, then the woman. 
then the children. So when those children go crazy and mama can't take it and she has to fall back, who's there to catch her? The foundation. Because without a foundation, we lose it all. Thank you, Bishop. Another interesting thing as I was studying, and I love this, is that the word husband, while we're talking about family, it comes from the root word house bond. That's how we get husband. House bond. He's the glue that holds it all together. He's the thing, the sticky substance, the thing that gives support to the family and doesn't allow them to fall apart. He keeps the family together. Because he's a house bond. He's a husband. And all the blessed women in this house can say amen if you've got a good one, right? Isn't it interesting when we travel and Naomi, I mean, uh, Chelsea and Frank recently traveled to Ireland and and I got to live vicariously um, through them in their pictures and their stories Um, And also when Bishop and I, when we traveled to Turkey and um, just got to see all these amazing architectural structures and buildings and churches with stained glass and beautiful ornate carvings and buildings that are older than the buildings we have in this country. It's funny because you notice when you go to these places, you're taking it all in. And you're taking the pictures, right, of these buildings. I mean, you want to take a picture like Chelsea sent us one of the stained glass in this church. And, um, but it, I never see anybody taking any pictures of the foundation. You don't ever take a picture of the foundation because the foundation, most of the time, if it's a good structure still, is hidden. It's covered. It's quiet. It doesn't need you to tell it it's important. It's made to do what it's doing. It's holding that structure. Because without the foundation, who needs a wall? And who needs a window? If there's no foundation, the building falls. That's why it's funny when you see a good father or you see a man, he doesn't have to brag about the things that he does that are required of him and expected of him. Oh, you know, I paid the rent. Oh, okay. Hallelujah. I I guess I'll buy groceries this week. No, he just does it. Hidden, quiet, solid. Don't need no flash and pomp about what I am already created to be. That's just who I am. And that's how God made me in his likeness and in his image. He created the man. Foundation holds up everything. I actually Googled this when I was studying and I thought, you know what? What is the, what is the thing that causes um, when a building needs to be condemned? What is it that makes them make that decision? I just wanted to know. And the number one reason was the foundation. And here's how they stated it in Google. (laughs) If the foundation or load-bearing structure is damaged and or cracked, uneven floors or doors and windows that don't work right usually result. Failure of the whole structure will be the consequence in the long term. Destroy the man. Hit the father. The foundation. You put a crack in that thing. You you beat that thing long enough or you allow water or you allow things that erode that foundation and the whole house is condemned. The late Dr. Miles Monroe, what an awesome man of God. And if you've ever had the privilege to listen to him, um, he was just amazing. And that gift, I'm telling you, that mantle has got to be out there for somebody who needs to snatch it up and continue it in this earth because we are missing that. But he shared this years ago, and it bears repeating. Isn't it amazing? We're talking about foundation. We're talking about Adam. We're talking about real men. We're talking about husbands. 
And he said, isn't it amazing that when Eve spoke with the serpent, nothing happened. And when Eve went to the fruit and saw it, nothing happened. And when Eve picked the fruit, nothing happened. And she bit the fruit and she chewed the fruit and she swallowed the fruit. Nothing happened. (laughs) But when she took it to the foundation, the Bible says She gave some to her husband and he ate. And then it says, immediately, God, in my mind, I saw a picture of a movie where it's a beautiful garden and these people are happy and life is good. And all of a sudden, the word immediately, things start to crumble and wilt and they're sad, and it's dark, and a cloud rolls in, and they know something's wrong because the foundation has been hit. Sin is the result of man declaring independence from his father. And there we have the first man who said, I can do this on my own. I don't need you. I want to be like you, but if I do this, I don't need you. Also known as Adam, also known as Jesus, trying to minister that in the New Testament as the prodigal. Malachi uh, Malachi 4 tells us of this, and it's at the last chapter of the Old Testament, and many have read this, but while we're talking about this independence of the Father, the Father's heart is continually believing that this is going to take place. And he said, I'm sending Elijah the prophet to clear the way for the big day of God, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. We see where Jesus fulfilled that when he said, don't handle me, don't touch me. I have to go to the Father first. So he gave us the picture of how how perfectly it should work for every one of us when we know we've been away from our Father and it's time to come back to our Father because he's got so much that's in store for us and wanting to give it to us. Whenever a country is under a curse, it's because fathers are out of position. He said, I will smite them with a curse. And, um, and that's what we see in, in um, different societies today. Fathers are not in their place. Fathers are not in position. And you see the curse of fatherlessness in a nation. Fatherhood is the source and the solution. Come on, y'all. The world is full of males. How many of you agree? Oh, we full, it's full. It's full, right? But very few men and even less fathers. If you've been in this house any amount of time, you know that's my heart, the heart of my husband. The bishop of this house is a fathering spirit that he carries so amazing. And I'm not just talking about those that have had children biologically, but you being a father just by the way you carry yourself. A father is a father in in, in many situations because you just, it's just who you are. You're the foundation, right? Time Magazine did a story called Dad is Destiny. This was a few years back. And I want to just give you a few statistics. You want to hear a couple of things? I know it might make you sad, but I think we got some hope at the end here. But according to some of the stats of fatherlessness um, and and fathers not being present uh, as their child is being raised and growing in. These are some of the results of that. Um, Children have lowered levels of disrupt... um, Oh, having a father present causes lowered levels of disruptive behavior, acting out depression and telling lies, obeying parents, being kind to others, and being responsible, fewer behavioral problems in young boys, and girls being happier and more confident and willing to try new things. So that's if they had a daddy in their home. 
Fathers help to make wise life choices. I like this. The likelihood that a young male will engage in criminal activity doubles if he is raised without a father and triples if he lives in a neighborhood with a high concentration of fatherless families. The research is absolutely clear. The one human being most capable of curbing, curbing the antisocial aggression of a boy is his biological father. The problem of fatherlessness, this will break your heart. The United States is the world's leader in fatherless families. That just that troubles me on so many levels. Approximately, and I think it's greater than this because this is an old study, 34% of all children will go to bed in a home where their father does not reside. Well, how, how does father love make it? How is it different from mother love and why does it matter? I love this. Mothers and fathers parent differently and this difference is a big benefit for children. Fathers do not mother. Come on, ladies, get that clear. You can't expect the daddy to go do what you, only you can do. So fathers do not mother. And fatherhood turns out to be a complex and unique phenomenon with huge consequences for the emotional and intellectual growth of children. Um, a, a child psychologist just explained that father love and mother love, what y'all think it is, <laughs> is different kinds of love, right? Fathers love more dangerously. I like that. Because their love is more expectant, more instrumental than a mother's love. <clears throat> fathers parent differently. Fathers play differently. I love this. While mothers and fathers are both physical with their children, fathers are typically physical in different ways. Fathers tend to play with their children and mothers tend to care for them. And I am so serious when I tell you that's exactly how this household was. I was all about taking care, the hair, the food, their clothes. I would read stories, but more often than not, when they wanted to play, they went to daddy. It just is what it is. Oh, y'all go play. Oh, I'll take you to the park. Okay, y'all go play. You know, I, I, this is my time to rest from all the laundry and dishes and all that I've been doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fathers play with their children, um, mothers tend to care for them. Generally speaking, fathers tickle more, they wrestle, and they throw their children in the air. While mothers warn, not so high. <laughs> fathers chase their children, sometimes as playful, scary monsters. Fathers are louder at play, while mothers are quieter. Mothers cuddle babies, and fathers bounce them. Fathers roughhouse, while mothers are gentle. Fathers encourage competition, mothers encourage equity. Fathers encourage independence while mothers encourage security. Come on, y'all. Another child expert noted that children who roughhouse with their fathers learn that biting, kicking, and other forms of physical violence are not acceptable. They learn self-control by being told when enough is enough and when to settle down. Fathers build confidence. I like this one. This is great. I know this is a lot, but this is so good. <clears throat> Go to any playground and listen to the parents there. Who is often encouraging kids to swing or climb or just a little higher, or ride your bike a little faster, or throw a little harder? Who is encouraging kids to be careful? <laughs> Come on, you teachers and mothers and uh, fathers in here. Mothers tend toward caution while fathers often encourage kids to push the limits. Uh huh. Either of these parenting styles by themselves can be unhealthy. One can tend toward encouraging risk without consideration of consequences, and the other tends to avoid risk, which can fail to build independence and confidence and progress. But join together, come on. Dynamite, right? A couple more. Fathers communicate differently. Now, I want you, when you're sitting here thinking about this, whether you had that present in your home or not, you have a heavenly father that loves you and wants to communicate with you and wants to play with you. I want you just to sit with him and sit. he wants to hear you sing to him. Fathers communicate differently. A major study showed that when speaking to children, mothers and fathers are different. 
Mothers typically simplify their words and speak on the child's level. Fathers are not as inclined to modify their language for their child. Father's talk tends to be more brief. Come on, y'all. I remember my dad, directive and to the point. Get in there, wash your hands, go get to the table. It's time for dinner. That's it. Now, you kids, come on. I told you how many times dinner is ready. Get in here. I have been, I, I, you know, and mothers just go, right? Dad's just like, get yourself in there right now. And you did it. Directive, to the point, brief. I liked this, too, because it also makes a greater, he also makes a greater use of facial expressions and subtle body language. Mothers tend to be more descriptive, personal, and verbally encouraging. And children who do not learn how to understand and use both styles of conversation will be at a disadvantage because they will experience both of these styles as they enter the adult world. If you had a daddy who all he had to do was go. When you see that in your adult life with a boss that goes, you don't know what that means. But if you never saw that and you had a mother that, now, honey, I told you, now, if you will just do this and you, then you'll do that, then I'll let you have your snack. Or if you will go and make your bed, then we will go do something fun. And then when you become an adult, you're waiting for your boss to say, now, please, if you will just do that job I just gave you on your desk, then I will give you a bonus. So we learn to read those body languages and subtle su suggestions that come forth from a male figure in our life. They discipline differently. Fathers prepare children for the real world. Generally speaking, fathers tend to see their child in relation to the rest of the world, while mothers tend to see the rest of the world in relation to their child. For example, a mother sees in relation to her child, the world, like the things that could cause harm for her children. Like there's lightning and there's cats and there's dogs and there's like, oh, I don't want any other mean kids. And a father sees the world different. He sees it in relation to his kids. Why, like he wants to, um, he's not as, it's not that he's concerned with these, uh, unconcerned with these things, but he tends to focus on how his children will or will not be prepared for something that they might encounter in the world. Like teaching your daughter how to change a tire, a flat tire. He prepares her because it could happen, and it does happen. Or don't let your gas needle go too far, baby, or you're going to run out of gas. Sorry, Chelsea. Uh, <laughs> Fathers provide a look at the world of men. This one was big for me. Men and women are different. They eat differently. They dress differently. They smell differently. They cope with life differently. Stereotypically, fathers do man things and mothers do woman things. Girls and boys who grow up with a father are more familiar and secure with the world of men. And girls involved with fathers are more likely to have healthier, more confident relationships with boys and adolescents and men in adulthood. This is because girls have a greater opportunity to learn from their fathers how men should act toward women. And they understand from experience which behaviors are inappropriate. Hello. Girls raised by involved fathers also have a healthy familiarity with the world of men. And they don't wonder how a man's facial stubble feels or what it's like to be hugged by strong arms. This knowledge builds emotional security and safety from the exploitation of predatory males. Boys who grow up with dads are less like to, likely to be violent. They have their masculinity affirmed and can learn from their fathers how to channel that masculinity and strength in positive ways. Fathers can teach respect for the other sex, and I'm done um, with this. Girls with involved fathers, therefore, are more likely to select good boyfriends and husbands because they have had a good model by which to judge all candidates. Fathers also help weed out bad candidates. <laughs> I got a shotgun, and you better. <laughs> and then boys raised with fathers are more likely to be good husbands because they can emulate their father's strength and learn from their shortcomings. Did you learn something? I thought that was incredible. I love the dis distinctions and the diversity and the difference and how we've all gleaned from that. I have a personal story. I remember the first time I got to spend any quality time with Bishop. Um, 
we attended, I don't know how many of you know our story. We try to share bits and pieces of it. He does, I do. But um, we happened to both be going to the same little church in California. And he was in the Navy, and I was still in high school. <laughs> and um, I'd see him in church, and he came and ministered one time with the guitar and sang and kind of caught my attention. But then we were invited to like a youth group thing, and, and he was friends with the youth group leader, and they asked him to come on. It was somebody's birthday. And as a 15-year-old girl, because I had a good father in the home, because I knew what it meant to have a dad, um, these things I just read, I remember that's one of the first things I remember noticing about him other than he was pretty cute, you know. And he was funny. He made me laugh. And my daddy used to make me laugh. But he made every child feel like they were important. And that was big to me. That was like, wow, he's going to be a good father one day. He's a single 20-something-year-old man. And when he played with these kids and they would, they would all gravitate toward him, that to me stood out even in my young 15-year-old mind. Amen? You've got that in this house. And it, go ahead, Yes. Hey, I'm going to just go off script here, but I try to protect that as much as I can. I'm sorry, but it really frustrates me and it makes me angry when people take advantage of that heart and they abuse the fact that they have easy access to him. And I'm constantly, when they want to walk away from that and don't realize what they've got when they've got it, I'm constantly saying, could you change your phone number and just give it to the ones that, because I don't want, I don't want them to have that access anymore. <laughs> All right, confessions, confessions of a pastor's wife, <laughs> but it's real, it does, because he's, he invests, he really get when you get his attention, and you get his time, and he just out of the blue calls you, he gives all, he really does, he's given you his undivided attention, and then when that's not valued, it, it hurts, it makes me sad. Because I know even my children suffered and had times where they didn't have daddy because he was counseling someone who eventually left a year later. Yes, yeah, it's, it's real. So no wonder after reading the statistics here, y'all, no wonder after we see all the things that a father can contribute to children, to his legacy, to the things that he produced and brought into this world, no wonder... They're at the top of the devil's hit list. Just men in general, because they carry that, that's who they were created to be. They are the number one target. I picked this up yesterday. I happened to get, while I was studying, and I happened to ch jump on in um, social media. And Pastor Eli Moreno, y'all remember Pastor Eli? He just kind of, he just had this on his wall yesterday and posted. He said, the only way the devil can destroy you is to get you to destroy yourself. And I thought that is so fitting with where I'm going today with this message is because the only way the enemy can get to you men is if you allow him to. And if you, if you wa walk into the traps that he sets for you, if you continue to not listen to your father when he's directing you. And there's a lot of areas that, that the enemy knows he can get it, uh, in on when he's attacking our men and the generation of men in this country. So right now, I want you, if you've got pen and paper, or if you want to put it in your little tablets, whatever you're doing, I've got five takeaways for you to man up. Five takeaways. Girls, write this down. You're single. This is what you need to um, be looking for out there. This is what you need to know when you're looking for someone that may be um, uh, wanting to date you, wanting to uh, eventually marry you. These are some great qualities that um, you want to be looking for. <clears throat> Five takeaways to man up. Number one, take time daily with Papa. Take time daily with the Father God. If you want to man up and be a real man, a real kingdom man, then you will know how to pray. And ladies, let me help you here. A man, when some of you think, oh, my husband, he don't pray. He needs to pray more. My husband, he, I wish he would get in there and I wish he would just pray for his family and do it. Honey, 
they don't pray like we do. We in there, Jesus, I bind you, devil. God, I ask you to cover. And you get in there and you pray and you sing and you walk and you shout and you cry. A man will just say, God, you know what I need this week. I'm trusting you. I thank you. Amen. That's fine because that's how a man will pray. He's direct. He's to the point. He knows what he needs. He's going to bring it to the Father, and then he's going to walk by faith that that which he prayed is coming to pass. We will moan and groan and cry and do all the other more times than not. But I'm just saying, a man has to become a man of prayer. And that can be in your car as you're on your way to work. That can be um, right before you lay that, that head down to get some rest. Amen? Um, we're like, I, we, I think Bishop quoted this last week. We are way too familiar with a God. We barely know Bobby Connor said. So if you're not a man who's getting daily in the word and communing with your heavenly father, then you ain't got nothing for the foundation, for the foundation and the house that you're holding up to keep them going on. Amen. Number two. So number one was what? Five, take aways. <laughs> take time. Number two, take responsibility. Definition of responsibility is the state or act of being accountable for something. The opportunity or ability to act independently and make decisions without authorization. Honey, what, is it okay? Do you want me to... No, uh, yeah, no, yeah, no. <laughs> Take responsibility. We're looking for you to do it. We're like, well, I hope you know what to do. <laughs> the state or act of having a duty to deal with something. Just deal with it. Come on, ladies, look at them and say, just deal with it. You're the first. You're the, you're the foundation. This, this gentleman is incredible, and I'm, I follow him. His name's Tom Nicola. He's a personal, he's a physical trainer, but he's also just an incredible man of God and um, just got good stuff in general. But um, one of his blogs said, when you believe that you're responsible for much and entitled to little, you change your expectations. That, to me, explains a real man all day long. Did you, see, did you hear that? When you believe that you're responsible for much and entitled to little, you change your expectations. Bishop said it more than, a number, more than on one occasion. When you're um, the possessors of nothing but the stewards of everything, there's responsibility. I've been given this to steward. I'm responsible for this. I don't possess it. I don't possess her. I don't possess my children. They don't belong to me, but I steward them. Then you'll change your expectations because you have a right thinking about what your situation is. You don't expect... Now, what I, following that statement, when you are responsible and, you, and are entitled to little... You don't expect the people around you to meet your every need and the universe to do your bidding. You don't look for others to cheer you on as you take on basic adult responsibilities. Oh, come on, right? Do you see it around you? Because I, I know I ain't talking to any of the men in this house. But y'all got to write these notes down because there's plenty that you need to share this with. The ones that are coming up that don't have a clue what it means to be a man. And they're waiting for someone like you who's got the God in you that you have to help them. <laughs> I like this. Um, you, don't, you, you, do, you do basic responsibilities and you shudder at the idea of using the hashtag, hashtag adulting is hard. I like that. Entitled people blame, criticize, and point fingers at others. They see themselves as victims. Responsible people, responsible. See, I said everybody could get something from this because I'm taking this in too. They take ownership. They build others up, just like I said. And they point their fingers first at themselves. 
Oh, we could all learn that one. Yeah, but you know, it was because the, uh, and I just couldn't, and then, yeah, you know, and then the traffic light wouldn't change, and I had to sit there thinking, no, you got out the door late. Just admit it. <laughs> all right, what was number two? Take ownership is number three. Take ownership of the problems around you, even though you didn't create them. God, that is, that is a man all day long. The situation is chaos. There's water running everywhere. One of the kids left something going or a toilet was running. He just takes control and takes care of the situation and, 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 and doesn't expect someone else to do it or, or even if it wasn't his fault, right? Take ownership. I've got this. The foundation is supporting you. The foundation is holding you up. The foundation says, I can take this. I'm built for this. I love this quote. There's a serious lack of ownership everywhere these days, whether it's in politics and business relationships or life in general. It seems no one is to blame for anything. It's the not my fault era. Everyone knows someone else, somewhere else is to blame for everything that happens, right? You hear it in the news. You hear it in your, at your job. You hear it in the schools. You hear it? It is the not my fault era. <laughs> All right, number four. Hey, we're getting through these. We're doing it. We're doing it. Number four, take instruction. <sighs> Take instruction, seek knowledge, get wisdom. I mean, come on, y'all. Proverbs 4, 1 through 10 in the message says, listen, friends, to some fatherly advice. Sit up, take notice so you'll know how to live. I'm giving you good counsel. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. When I was a boy at my father's knee, Father, son, come on, y'all. The pride and joy of my mother, he would sit me down and drill me. Take this to heart. Do what I tell you. Live. Sell everything and buy wisdom. Forage for understanding. Do you know what forage means? That means getting down and looking for it and digging for it and getting behind things. Oh, there's some wisdom. I found it. Don't forget one word. Don't deviate an inch. Never walk away from wisdom. She guards your life. Love her. She keeps her eye on you. Above all and before all, do this. Get wisdom. Write it at the top of your list. Get understanding. Throw your arms around her. Believe me, you won't regret it. Never let her go. You'll make your life glory. She'll make your life glorious. She'll garland your life with grace. She'll festoon your days with beauty. Dear friend, take my advice. It will add years to your life. That has so much weight that we have no time today to cover. But did you hear that? It will add years to your life. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge. I'm talking about in every arena of life. So basically the takeaway of number four, taking, take instruction, seek knowledge, become a lifelong student. And I, I, I am saying this to everyone in this room, be a lifelong student, be someone who's always looking to learn more. Be, be a man. If if you're going to be a man too, let me tell you this, you're going to have to be a reader. Shut the TV off. Get the book out. Get the main book, the book. But then there are so many books out there that you can gain knowledge and, and, and wisdom from. Because remember, if you've studied the Genesis story, I don't remember God saying anything to Eve. All the instruction that the father gave was to who? Adam. Adam, you're going to do this. I need you to do this with the animals. I need you to tend this. I need you to do that. I need you to cultivate. I need you to. 
And here's a wonderful nugget. I think it was Miles Monroe said this too. He said, a man is a cultivator. So God is never, so gentlemen, just sit up straight and just take it like it is. He is never going to give you a finished product. Because he knows what he's put on the inside of you, you will be able to get out of the thing that he gives you. You'll bring it out. He don't give you, here, here, here's him again. He's not going to give you a chair. He's not going to give you a table. He's going to say, get it out of that tree. And I love this too. Um, so if you're still single, gentlemen, and you're looking for that perfect woman, she ain't out there. She's only in your mind. Because he's going to give you an unfinished wife. You're going to cultivate her, girl. (laughs) I should be better today because of the influence of a man of God than I was 37 years ago. Or there's something wrong. Men, if you're embarrassed of your wives, that's on you. If she ain't up meeting your expectations of what you think she should be, then you need to get to work. Cultivate. That's who you are. You're going to take it. Because when you take the instruction from Papa, when you're praying daily and in the word daily, then you're able to teach your family. Father spoke to Adam. Adam spoke to Eve. Father teaches Adam. Adam teaches Eve. Eve teaches children. Papa teaches children too. But there's that order. He gave us that order. Teach your family. If you ain't got nothing in you to give them, what are they going to do? That's, we just read what, when a father is present. What's he doing in those moments? Teaching those babies. Interacting with those babies. Loving those babies. Nurturing and guarding and guiding and governing them. When you say govern, that's not a bad thing. That's saying I'm giving you boundaries. A child begs to, to give, uh, have boundaries given to them. You tell me, teachers, you can tell a child that has no boundaries. They are the worst, most ruthless, unruly children in your classroom because they're begging for you. My mom don't give me none at home. My daddy ain't even there. But I need you to help me learn where my boundaries are. Teach your family. I like the name of this book. You could, men, write this down. Here's one of your first books. It's called Mansfield's Book of Manly Mans, Manly Man, Manly Men. Mansfield's Book of Manly Men. Chelsea, don't laugh at your mama. <laughs> His name's Stephen Mansfield. Mansfield's Book of Manly Men. I didn't make the text big enough. Sorry, I had to put the glasses on. <sighs> These, I hate them. <laughs> but I love this. This is what he said. Weak men assume what they need to know will seek them out. Men of great character and drive search out the knowledge they need. (laughs) I can only compare to what I've had demonstrated in my life. So I had my biological father, who I just met in my 40s. And then I had the dad that raised me when I was adopted me when he married my mother. And I watched him. And then the next one that I was able to watch would be the man that I married, which is my husband. And I can tell you to this day, this man can either fix it already or he's going to find a way to fix it. Come on, y'all. That is the most comforting thing to a female in all the world um, is to know that, I mean, I really believe he can fix anything. And because if he can't find it and do it on his own, he'll find a way to get it done. Amen? All right. Last but not least, number five. Oh, and you're going to get mama in this one because this is a big one for me. So y'all ready? The fifth takeaway to man up is to take care of your own health. Take care of your own body. Take care of yourself. I'm going to quote Tom again. I like this. Tom Nicholas says, your body reflects your standards, man. Your body is a billboard. 
It's the first thing people notice about you long before they learn of your education, accomplishments, or your heart of gold. Do they see self-discipline, perseverance, self-respect, strength, and self-restraint? Do they notice a smoothness in the way you move and a confidence in the way you stand? When you run into people from your past, do they think, wow, what happened to you? (laughs) Oh, (laughs) Um, he used to be in such good shape. Or do they think, wow, what happened to him? He looks great. Or do they think nothing at all? You don't have to look like Wolverine, nor do you need the strength of Thor. I'm quoting someone here, y'all. No, I didn't say this. Or you don't have to have the endurance to complete an Ironman. However, your physical appearance does paint a picture in others' minds. In their subconscious, they assume the way you care for your body is the way you care for everything else. What'd you say? <laughs> he said, drop the mic. <laughs> I like this. He finishes with this. Can you see how responsibility requires action? Which one was responsibility in the number four? Two. 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 Requires action. When you take 100% responsibility for your health and fitness, you find a way. You find a way. Guys, get ready to write because I got some great ones from this man. He's a personal trainer. He's a fit guy. He's been, through the, he's been through cancer and survived. He loves God, and this is what he says are his basic takeaways for men and their health. Number one, lift heavy things. Right? Come on, you're built for it. The strength that you have, the muscle mass that you have that we don't have, you are made to lift heavy things. You need to weight train at least three times per week every week. Now, you, now some of you that got, get ready to get started back in this, you need to wait and build yourself up and take it easy. Start with, you know, the milk jugs maybe. Just ease on into it. Okay, number two, move frequently throughout the day. If you are at a sedentary job and you sit at a computer all day long, you need to be getting up every, at least every hour and walking and moving that body, not just to go to the restroom, but to just move. So move frequently throughout the day. Number three, eat plenty of protein with every meal. We talked about muscle. You're going to be lifting heavy things. We need something to fill those, pro- those muscles with, and that is protein. So you need to be eating protein, not chips, not, come on, not donuts. You need some protein. <laughs> You're going to get protein donuts. All right now, Bishop. And the next one, get at least seven hours of sleep each night. Okay, how many of you get less than seven? Oh, shame, shame, shame. Did you know that could be one of the reasons you're not able to lose the weight? That could be one of the bigger reasons you're not able to get that last five pounds off. Reasons that people don't realize is when the body doesn't get into that deep, restful, restorative sleep, then the cortisol is elevated then their blood sugar is off, and the next morning all they crave is something carbohydrate-rich or sugar-laden. So the cycle never breaks. And if you would just make yourself shut off the computer, shut off the TV at least an hour, two hours preferably, and pick up that book and read, it will bring you into a state of calm, and your body will go, oh, yeah, It's dark now. I don't have a light glaring in my eyes saying, it's still day. It's still day. It's why can't I go to sleep? Because you're telling it it's still light. Your body naturally will start releasing melatonin as the sun sets. And if you're having trouble, supplement with melatonin. Hey, it's a good thing. And you get that restful sleep. So did that help anybody? I told you I was going to give you a little more on this. There's a little bit I know about this stuff. Um, Avoid foods and drinks that wreak havoc on your health. If you're still eating Twinkies, Jesus help them. I can't do it. (laughs) If you're still going and eating high, saturated, fatty, fried stuff, put it down. If you're drinking Gatorades and 
green Mountain Dew things that have all that stuff? Let me tell you this. When you're looking at your foods and you're deciding whether you want to eat something, if you can turn it over, if it's in a package, and it has more, usually more than five ingredients, you don't need it. Put it down. Get back to the way food should have been eaten, and that's from its most natural state. And if you're eating stuff that you can set on a shelf and come back a year later, and it's just as fresh when you open it, yeah, that's bad. So, I mean, these are simple. These are easy little steps, come on, to get you started, right? The last one, uh, and two more, take your supplements. I know some people are like, well, I get, I get all I need from the food I eat. No, apparently not. <laughs> because really, I'm not saying it's anything uh, negative on you. I'm saying um, because of the way food is grown in this day and age and the ground that is constantly being used and depleted and depleted and nobody's allowing it, like God showed them and told them to do, let it rest and restore itself, then the food is not coming to us with what it should and um, we need to supplement. So you need to be on a good supplement regimen and you don't just have them, oh, honey, I bought all my supplements, and then all week they just sit there because that ain't going to do no good, right? So um, Bishop's been trained really well. He gets them out every day, and he's doing them. And then the last one, and this one's big, and I'm, I know, man, but come on. This is the way the enemy is getting access. You are destroyed because you allow it. When you don't listen and you don't take wisdom and you don't add knowledge and you don't say, I, you know, I got to quit expecting things to change if I don't change. What they say, that's madness, right? To believe that doing the same thing over and over and then you're expecting something to be different. If I keep doing these horrible things and these bad habits in my life when we're talking about our health and I expect the next day to wake up and feel good. No, it ain't going to happen. The last one is to get a full metabolic assessment each year. Go see the doc. He ain't going to hurt you. He's just going to say, hey, you know what? This is a little elevated. And you may want to put the donuts down because your sugar looks a little high. Get assessed when you feel like you don't feel like yourself. Get assessed when something's hurting instead of going, oh, I'll just, come on, man. You know how you do. I'll just work it out. <laughs> No, you may have a problem in there. <laughs> All right, I'm finished. I got a couple of things, and um, you may want to grab some Kleenex because these are some good little things here we want to share. I love this. This is a great takeaway. So five takeaways, and this is how we're going to end our takeaways. Um, who wrote them down? Number one. Awesome. Thank you. Number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Yes. <laughs> and here is for you because as you start to take those little incremental baby steps toward positive and toward these takeaways, even when you're moving slow, you're still passing the one on the couch. <laughs> right? Come on. High five a brother. Girl, come on. High five. I may be moving slow, but I'm passing you, Bubba. Get off that couch. Get in your word. So the title today is uh, Man Up from the Floor Up. <laughs> you foundation men. We've got um, some special things we want to honor the fathers today with. And um, I have to, uh, first of all, honor the, the father of my children um, which for me is always an awesome thing to do because of who he is and what he carries. Um, you know, we say uh, that he fathers that home and he teaches that household. And he really did that with me. You know, I married him at 16, so uh, he still had a lot of <laughs> teaching and uh, growing up for this girl to do. And he was, he was wonderful. When my dad handed my hand and put it in his hand he knew he, he could trust him with me and that's what every father hopes and prays that he can do with his daughter one day is that he can hand her off to someone who can continue the journey with her and be the man in her life the friend, the lover the teacher and the foundation the one that supports her 
and supports those children as they come. So I'm going to let Chelsea to give you guys a break from my voice for a minute to be the first one. And his three daughters today, two of them are at a convention with their business and they, uh, Naomi wasn't able to be here, but she sent me something that she wanted me to share and Vanessa did as well. But I want this picture, of course, this was a picture and I don't know if you can see, but there's two little, little Indians in the teepee and, um, this really represents the dad in this house. So Chelsea, you can go first. <laughs> um, I love Father's Day and I love Mother's Day and I love any day that we can sit back and recognize the people who raised us. So on the way here, I was getting words together and voice texting and you know, driving. And I come to a stoplight as I'm talking about my father. And here he goes, right past me in my sister's car. And I just like was bawling because I'm talking about him. And then I just see him go in front of me, being a father, doing something so he can go pick up his other baby from the airport in her car. And it was just like, okay, now I'm wrecked. So I hope my words make sense, but... Um, here it is. So the word father can mean so many different things to so many different people, especially those who have never had a present father on this earth or a father that was present in their life. I am so grateful that my daddy has always been present for me, not only physically, but spiritually. When I think of my father, I think of a protector, a provider, a comedian, a healer, and a wise instructor. I think back to riding my bike for the first time and how many times I would fall down, start to cry, and get so frustrated at myself. But every time he would pick me up, brush off the gravel from my wounds, kiss it, and say, it's okay, buddy. It's, it's okay. He never gave up until I was soaring through the wind. I think of the sleepless nights tossing and turning in my bed from f the fear of the unknown or the boogeyman or monster that was in my closet. I knew I could creep into my daddy's room, go to his side of the bed, <laughs> and he would wake up and wrap his arms so tight around me, come into my room, turn a nightlight on, open the closet, show me everything was okay, and then sometimes he may even have acted like he kicked the boogeyman and said, get out of here, go home, which would make me laugh. And then he would pray the fear away. <laughs> and that would give me the best feeling of peace and I would fall right to sleep and know that I was safe. Or how, every, how about every time I was sick? My daddy never missed a moment to pray over me and make sure that I knew that my body was the temple of the Holy Spirit. Somehow, even still with fever and chills and a snotty nose, I felt like everything was gonna be just fine because my daddy prayed for me and that my heavenly father would heal me. He never, never once let me feel embarrassed because like a good dad, he would take my attention off of the situation by doing something completely ridiculous and silly, like dancing awkwardly or talking in the Donald Duck voice to make me laugh as soon as I wanted to hide. He knows how to distract me from my uncomfortable moments in life. I think my dad understands me on a level most can't because he too was the baby. He knows my heart and he knows my fears. He knows just how to send my shame away. And then I think of the day that I got married, the true day <laughs> that I got married. And my dad stood underneath the most beautiful tree to join me together with the most amazing man and show that man the true love of Christ and the love of a father. As I continue to get older with each year, my dad never fails to teach me something new and to answer my questions that no one else can seem to answer. He continues to teach me to pray over my mind and my body. He teaches me humility and how to love others well. 
He even makes sure I know exactly how to fill my gas tank, even though I thought I could take it a little further. I am so thankful for the man that I call father. And above all, I'm thankful because that man also taught me how to love my heavenly father even more. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. You're my buddy for life. (laughs) Woo, God. This is Naomi's voice text. I had to transcribe it this morning. Um, She said, I have a lot of vivid memories of my daddy growing up, whether it was praying before we went to sleep or reading about Jesus before every Christmas and just waiting in anticipation for the presents, (laughs) or whether it was just how fun he made the most simple things, like outside games, Or there were so many different ones, but the best one I remember, and I'll never forget as a child, is watching him fish or going fishing with him. And I don't really like to go fishing. I'm not the fishing girl. I'm definitely not keen on baiting a hook, but I know how to do it. And I don't ever want to learn how to clean a fish, let alone watch my dad clean a fish. This is so Naomi. That's just too much for me. But I do like sitting there and watching my dad fish and catching them myself and watching his face light up. It's definitely one of those moments where I've never seen my dad as happy as he could be when he is fishing. So today, though, my best memories today are the fact that it doesn't matter how old I am. He always gives me the best advice, and he's always, always praying and fighting for me, and that is priceless. To know that you can always pick up your phone and call your dad, and he's always going to answer and be there for you. So he's kind of the best. I don't tell him all the time. (laughs) But today, I especially wanted him to know that I'm super thankful and grateful that God gave me him. And she said, I love you. And he'll be picking her up, of course, later at the airport. And now for Vanessa, and I'll be finished. You still with me? Y'all, am I making the daddies cry? Making anybody cry? So the reason this picture is the one we chose, it was such a perfect picture for every one of my girls because I love, you see two in the teepee and he's carrying little fat one on his back. (laughs) But this is what Vanessa said. She goes, this is my dad memory. The other day, this photo came up on my Facebook from a past post. And as I looked, it was the best heart that stood out. My dad. You were a dad with three little girls, and that was my favorite. (laughs) You being a girl dad, made for the best memories. And that is the thing you loved and still love most, making memories. I have a lot of them like RV trips and giant moons in Montana, fishing in Fontana while watching you eat sardines, (laughs) to baking tiny cakes in our Easy Bake Oven and you being the tea party pinky up papa. Oh, did you hear that? The tea party pinky up papa. Do y'all know what that is? (laughs) Okay. The thing that stopped me in my tracks with this photo was something that I did not remember. Oh, sure, I remember going to the Smoky Mountains and posing in random things on the road, on the side of the road. I loved that. I didn't remember what he was sacrificing for these mementos to come true. I saw his shoes. And when you showed me the video, Bishop, that you chose this morning about the little boy in the shoes, I just lost it. I saw his shoes. Yes, it was the early 90s, but these were not expensive or new. The shoes are what caught my eye. Something I'd never paid much attention to before. They're worn. They're not the trend. Probably inexpensive and second best. They represent my dad's heart towards us always. Taking the lesser to always give us more making sure we were on an adventure, seeing the world through a lens less tainted and still full of wonder. We probably didn't have a lot of money when this picture was taken, but he never let on to that. His shoes are the only clue and I never noticed because the smiles stole the show. I love you, Daddy, 
Thank you for teaching me to wonder and see this journey as an expedition full of whatever we make it. Perspective to see the good in every situation and always playing second to give us more. I love you so much and all the things your voice and face have instilled in my heart. Oh, happy Father's Day. <laughs> Can you stand on your feet this morning and let's just honor and give a hand clap to all the fathers in the room. Happy, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. And come on up here, Daddy. Hey, you want to honor the... <laughs> Girls like to make their dads cry too. <laughs> so guys, this is what it's like being around all girls. Because if I'd had a, a son, he would have been helping me out. So I've had to, uh, I've had to, and I had to, I've been blessed to have these kind of memories it seems like when Father's Day comes now, the older I get, my girls start to give more back to me. And the older you get, the more your children give back to you. That's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. And uh, so, but every Father's Day, it just gets worse and worse, but better. I feel like I'm, 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 I feel like it was a funeral, you know, but it's not. But I want to honor all the men, so I'm going to back up. Guys, I want you to come up here. All the fathers, come on up here. Come on up here. If you're a stepdad, come on up here and just line up right in front of me here. Stepdads. And I, I want to say this too today. Um, and I agree with one of our one of our precious sisters who watches our stream uh, and I totally agree with her heart. And one of the things that we didn't say on Mother's Day is we, we need to also honor mothers who may have not physically given birth or guys who, but, but our dads and that have, have adopted children, et cetera, et cetera. We honor all fathers who, who watch after children. And today for these men that are here, um, I just want to bless them. Amen. I want to bless them with, with love, with kindness, and with honor, and with dignity. Come on over here, brothers, getting in the line. Scoot over. I, I want them all to be seen. Come on, let the brothers come on in the line. You guys are now on TV across the world. Amen. So pan across there and see all of our, all of our good dads. Let's give all of our dads a God bless you, man. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And then Pastor Nick, you know, if you if he's not done, we honor him as well. But I just want to I just want to bless you. When I saw that scripture a few minutes ago, and by the way, did my wife say something that is deeply embedded inside of it? Come on, let's give it up. I loved it because it wasn't her usual style, but it was it was impactful. And I think that this will be something you will want to go back and look at. I mean, my wife, my wife could be a nutritionist. She is a counselor. She's a life coach. She's got all of the pieces, and uh, and so I just honor her by uh, to, in honoring me. It's just an amazing thing. But as well, look at these men. That scripture comes to my heart that she had up in the book of Malachi. And at that time, he says, I will turn the hearts of the fathers, right? And the hearts of the children. And we've, we've seen those, we've seen turning the heart, turning the hearts of the fathers. But really, the, the thing that, brought, that just really stood out to me there was heart. Turning your heart. And when my, when my daughters just said what they did, what did it do for my heart? Y'all felt it because you love me, but that's your, that's what a father, that's what a father loves to hear because his heart, he don't really talk much about it. We don't talk, but our hearts feel deep. Somebody say deep. 
I love my girls. And one time Chelsea was telling us about her sisters in West Virginia. When we lived in West Virginia and we just moved into a new house and, and there was a big hill. You know, of course, anywhere in West Virginia, you're on a hill. And we was on top of a mountain and, it, and the backyard went down in and there was a drain that came off of our off of our we had one of those sewers that drained down and had a had a little filtering system way down there and it was charcoal and and by the time it got down there the water was pretty clean but it looked like a little creek anyway chelsea came and she was telling on her sisters she said daddy 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 the sisters the sisters i said what she called them the sisters she said they're in the woods i said okay no she said no they're in the woods deep <laughs> so I went deep in the woods to find out they were down there and they thought it was a stream they was drinking out of it but anyway God thank you Jesus for keeping my kids <laughs> one of them has lost her uh, her gallbladder though Jesus thank you Lord that's it <laughs> but something about deep somebody say deep the Bible says deep calls to deep right deep calls unto deep and men men are deeper than you think they are because sometimes we just don't have the words to say it but you guys are that deep piece that every family needs you're the foundation and I will say this over you to this house too those of you who are part of this house all of you really you're the foundation of the stone you 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 carry so much more than maybe we give you credit for. But today, I just want to honor all of you fathers because you are. And we've got one in here, and I've asked him to come up because he is a father just in, I was actually kind of feeling, we thought to ourselves, what if she goes into labor today on Father's Day? But he's gonna he's our newest dad just in a short time. But we just want to honor you and 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 that God will turn, that God turns your heart to your children. And whatever God wants to do with your life, it's up to you and him. But I know he does want your heart to be turned always to your children. And that's what a dad is. So we want to bless you today just with a little gift. These are for you, especially for you just go right down the line and you need to know that your bishop did this himself i went out and did this i picked all of this out i got the card i got the i got everything in there and i actually wrote on each card just for you and jamie we got a special card just for you too because we wanted you to be included today now let's just Let's just stretch our hands out toward all the dads. Father, we thank you today, Lord, for the release of a new level for these brothers. Oh, we, re we, we just thank you for a release to a new level of fatherhood for them. That God, their children will, bl will be blessed even more this year by their presence. And that God, you will, you will lengthen their days. You will strengthen them. You will enlarge their territory. Every one of them every one of them and I, pro I prophesy Lord life and health and stalwartness and, and forward motion for every man in this room and God may their families see that may their families make a note of this even this Father's Day dad is different in Jesus name everybody shout amen one more time give it up for our dads today and my wife and my girls, God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. Ladies, we love you. Now, don't forget, Wednesday night, Wednesday night, we won't be at the office. Tune in to CCOP. Everybody say CCOP.org. All right, so you can tune in as early as Tuesday night. Tuesday night, uh, a, a Dallas cowboy will be preaching. Amen. He used to be a Dallas cowboy. Amen. He's going to be preaching so get in on the conference. We love you. Love on somebody today. And let's give it up for Brother Josh in the back and a new camera girl back there. And they held, out, they held it down today and did a great job in Kyle's absence. Amen. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. See you soon. Amen.